I, I take heart from the fact that when uh, I mean, various people, no to ID most notably, started you know, full-time arguing the case uh, against identity cards, that was a real uphill struggle. Uh, there was, it was two to one against, appeared to be the, against the argument, I two to one in favour of ID cards, people you know, trotted out, nothing to hide, nothing to fear. And by consistent uh, argument, uh, that ground has been shifted, people's views have been changed. You can actually win civil liberties arguments, but you have got to be absolutely consistent, and you've got to work hard, and you've got to keep doing it. I think that the default resting place is that most people will be uninterested in civil liberties or assume that, well, yeah, I'm, I may be prior, yeah, I don't want to be intruding on, but yeah, that lot down the road whose children are a bit noisy or who dress differently or speak a different language or whatever, of course we can't trust them with civil liberties. And indeed, the more sophisticated will say, and I'm doing it on their behalf because they're more likely to be mugged than I am because they move in all those ghastly streets and so on. Um, so, uh, you can win this argument, and uh, I, I, I mean, again, this is sort of anecdotal evidence, but it's quite powerful <coughs> that my immediate line manager, Chris Grayling, the Shadow Home Secretary, was struck that uh, he was doing any questions a few weeks ago in, I think it was Gloucestershire or Somerset, it was somewhere in the West Country where you have that sort of Radio 4 audience. Uh, and he said, you, you all know what I mean, uh, <laughs> people I love and revere because I'm the whole conservative. Um, and, and by far the biggest round of applause he got, uh, in one of the many weeks where it was difficult for the government, so it was quite an easy bat batting wicket for him, um, was when he launched an attack on the DNA database and ended up saying it's just a matter of principle that you might be able to make people safer if they took everyone's DNA, if we were all on CCTV all the time, if we just removed any kind of personal freedom and space from our life. But I don't want to live in that sort of society. And rural Somerset or Gloucestershire, wherever it was, erupted in applause. So keep making the arguments is the answer. Gentlemen. Ah, um, Joe Edgerton. I am, um, apart from having known Damon for more years than I just like to confess, um, I am, um, I suppose I best serve on writing for the Jesuit online journal, Thinking Faith. Um, I should confess to begin with, I'm a dangerous criminal. Uh, not so long ago, I went to a speed trap at 38 miles an hour. The paperwork got lost, and I ended up convicted. So I'm one of these dangerous criminals. I just mentioned that it is ridiculous to have a situation where minor misdemeanors are categorised in the same way as red. Uh, but the more serious point I wish to make is this. I think we... It goes back to the philosopher of Aristotle who had this idea of natural slaves, women being inferior, etc. The fundamental flaw in this, which was picked up by Thomas Aquinas in the 12th, 13th century in the Macintyre, contemporary, is that people become natural slaves if they are deprived of the opportunity to play a part in civic life. It seems to me that there's a serious argument to be mounted. We deprive people of their liberties, we deprive them the opportunity to play a role in civic life, and thus we create a vicious spark decline. And there aren't natural slaves, <coughs> Aristotle was wrong, but there are the people of victims, of people who are running a society who are still. I'm always happy to find myself agreeing with Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't often happen when I'm addressing political audiences, but, but, but absolutely, I mean, it, it is an insight that even if some people abuse the freedoms you give them, and of course some people will, if you don't give them those freedoms, then your whole society is shot. You have not got a free society. Uh, and you have to want to start with the presumption that we live in a free society. And yeah, that was that was a, a difficult and radical argument to make uh, in, in the Middle Ages. It shouldn't be that difficult and radical in the modern age, uh, you know, where we are prosperous enough and enough people are educated uh, that we should be able to exercise choices. And I suppose the, the, the one point I would add um, is that all those who said that 9-11 changed everything and used that as code for saying, so any of you people who care about civil liberties, you can forget it now. There's, there's a, there are evil people out there who are willing to kill us on our own streets, so let's suspend all our civil liberties for the time being, <coughs> are absolutely wrong. And they're wrong in their own terms, because they talk about a war on terror. And we know that 
one of the things that happens in wartime is that you do suspend civil liberties. When you were fighting, you know, during the Second World War, quite a lot of civil liberties were suspended. But everyone knew that that was a time-limited fight for survival. You know, either we were going to win or lose the Second World War. If we lost it, then freedom was gone forever. If we won it, then freedom would be restored. The war on terror is not that type of war. It seems to me really very likely, I'm afraid to say, that during the lifetime of everyone in this room at the moment, however young you are, there will be terrorist outbreaks, there will be terrorist threats. And I don't want to be conned into thinking, well, we're in wartime now, so therefore we've got to have a temporary suspension of civil liberties. And that you know, those of you who are still alive in sort of 2080 uh, find that that suspension of civil liberties has actually gone on for most of the 21st century. So we, we, we really do need to have that, that basic insight that if you abolish freedom for the poor, you abolish freedom for everyone. Thank you very much. There's a question over there. So, gentleman at the front. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Danny De La Haye. I write for a civil liberties website. Um, you mentioned earlier that the state's role to be viewed as trying to control uh, excessive individual urges. I'm wondering whose role it might be to control excessive state urges. Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And, uh, the answer is, uh, the answer is, the, yeah, the glib answer is everyone. And probably the, the slightly more controversial answer is that it should be the role of possibly the most despised group in uh, modern Britain, which are elected politicians. You know, we are in the end the people who pass the laws. Uh, you know, I could vote and did vote against uh, the national ID card scheme. Uh, you know, one of the powers and privileges you have as a parliamentarian is that you can take your, your instincts uh, and, and do something effective with them in terms of, of making laws. So it seems to me it is now, as it always has been, absolutely the central role of Parliament, of the House of Commons, actually, to defend the liberties of the people of this country. So the short answer is it ought to be democratic politicians who are defending those liberties. Your I answer is the absence of the party win. Well, it didn't, I mean, yeah, the party, I, actually, the, the only time I've ever gone flatly against the three line was when I voted against ID cards, because at the time my party was misguidedly in favour of them, I'm happy to say. Uh, my views haven't changed, the Conservative Party's views have changed, and this is a significant improvement. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, and we all have to, every individual MP has to have a conscience. We won't have a disquisition about the party system and therefore the necessity for discipline and whips and so on. But when push comes to shove, you're elected as an individual, you've got to go back to uh, your own electors and say, I know, I, you know I, I'm elected on this party, but I feel so strongly about this, and I hope you do as well. Um, and on the whole, uh, if you do exercise your own conscience uh, occasionally, uh, funnily enough, people think better of you uh, rather than worse of you. So, you know, just be brave. I'm going to uh, take three questions in a batch so we can have them off. You make them short and pithy, and then Damon can uh, sum up. So, first gentleman over there. 